morning. Hi, come on in. Just take a seat. They're all good. How we doing? Doing good? All right. All right. Thumbs up even. I like it. Now, I got a question. What if you would come into church on Sunday morning and all the seats are gone? Not filled. Okay, that would be cool too. But what if every single bench in here was gone? Do you think we could still have church? Yes. We could have church? How would we have church? Stand. You stand? How else? You could sit on the floor. Yeah, you could sit on the floor. You could bring your own chair. You could do all kinds. Of, yeah. But, you know, the fact of that we have places to sit is important, isn't it? You know? How about at school? What if you went to school and all of a sudden your classroom was completely empty? No chairs, no desks, no nothing. Do you think you'd have a good day at school? Yeah. Standing all day long. You'd have a good day? Okay, that's cool. Yeah, it'd be a little hard, wouldn't it? Yeah. What if you went to a ball game, you had to go to a baseball game or a football game, and there was no seats anywhere, and you had to stand the entire time? <laughs> yeah. See, having a place to sit is important, isn't it? Now, what if you got to school or you got to church or you got to your ball game, you went to see the Colts play or, or somebody, and you got your ticket, and it says you're going to see in seat F7, and you get to F7 and somebody's in your seat. <gasps> what if somebody sits in your assigned seat at school and your desk and all your stuff's in there and somebody's sitting at your desk? What if you come into church and somebody's sitting in your assigned church seat? Uh, there's no assigned seat. There's no assigned church. seat in church, right? I, I dig that. That's a good that's a good ploy. But at church, at football, baseball, all the different games order sometimes are assigned. What if somebody do we get mad and huff and puff and and we throw them out of our seat and say, my seat, and sit down in a in a big rage? Yes. I hope. I hope we're I hope we're a little more friendly than that. Because the scripture that we're using in the big church today, it talks about Jesus comes in and he's throwing this big banquet. There's this big party going on. And he says, you know, at this party, there's some seats that are really important up by the speaker and stuff. And then there's other seats on down the table that, well, they're not as important. They're still important because we want you there. But they're not as important. And he says, be careful where you sit. Because sometimes you may think that you're more important than you really are. And somebody will come and say, hey, you need to move down because you don't, you don't need to sit there. You need to sit down here. That's kind of hard to comprehend right now. But it, it's kind of like if you would go into school and you would say, you know what? Today I'm going to sit in the teacher's seat because I'm super important. I'm awesome. And I'm going to sit in the teacher's seat. Yeah, but, and the teacher comes in and says, you can't sit there. You go out there and sit in your desk. Yeah, but, it's kind of the same thing. What? The teacher don't sit down? Yeah. Teachers probably don't sit down anymore, do they? No. Yeah. Yeah, they're a little more busy than that. But that would be kind of the same thing. Or maybe you come into church, and you come up there, and you sit in the front, and you say, I'm going to preach today because Pastor Roy just doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm going to do it today. I can help. You're going to help? Okay. <laughs> I'm losing my crowd here. But it's okay. Just remember that God does think you're very important. God will always have a seat for you. No matter where you go, no matter what you do, you may have to sit on the ground or sit on the floor or somewhere else, but God always wants you to sit in a place of importance because you are important to God. That's the point, okay? You're always important to God, and there's always a place, no matter how old, no matter how young, no matter how itty-bitty, or uh, Isaac's not here, I would say, how, how big you are because he's a big guy. Uh, or Zach, for that matter, who's like approaching, what, 14 feet tall, something like that. Yeah. He's 500. Yeah, Goliath is starting to say, wow, he's big. So, anyway. <laughs> all right, enough of this, and you all ready to go to Children's Church? Go have some fun? All right, I think Maddie's ready to take you and, and go and do and play and learn and, and uh, be a crew together. The rest of us are going to start singing, because it's time to get ready for worship. <laughs> Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest crowd and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. 
Literally, I, she's been gone for a while. But 
a, the story of Rosa Parks. I, now on Facebook, I'm I'm you know subscribed to a lot of strange things. You know, history of this and and you know liturgical that and all these different things. And so this history thing came up, and it was the story of Rosa Parks. And all of us know Rosa Parks. She got on a bus and she sat down, and and it was during the the, the time that if a, a white person needed a seat and a black person had a seat, then the black person had to get up, and the white person got to sit down. And and we know we know the history of this country. And she did. It. She didn't give up her seat, and and she stayed exactly where she was. But that story came up on my Facebook this week, and it just kind of triggered this whole passage that we have today and the importance of being asked. Being asked on where we sit and what we represent. Being asked where we go and what we do. Being asked all these different things. Now, I know what Jesus was doing in this passage. Jesus was teaching humility. Jesus was teaching, you know, presence of God. Jesus was teaching his disciples and his followers that sometimes, sometimes we really have a problem with thinking more highly of ourselves than we really ought to. Oh, I know, there's times to take a stand, or in Rosa Parks, you know, choice, to take a seat. There's, there's times. There's times that we stand up for what we believe in and, and we fight it tooth and nail and, and we're ready to, to dig in our heels and we're ready to take on whatever and whoever comes along. There's times when we choose not to jump in that foxhole. There's times that we choose. It goes back to that statement. You really don't have to attend every argument that you're invited to. You know, you don't have to fight the fight every single time. Jesus was talking about a banquet, and hear these words from Luke 14. <clears throat> One Sabbath, when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. When he noticed how the guests picked the places of honor at the table, he then told him this parable. When someone invites you to a wedding feast, do not take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. If so, the host who invited both of you will come and say to you, Give this person your seat. Then humiliated, you will have to take the least important place. But when you are invited, take the lowest place. So that when your host comes, he will say to you, Friend, friend, move, move to a better place then you'll be honored in the presence of all other guests. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Then Jesus said to his host, When you give a luncheon or dinner, do not invite your friends, your brothers or sisters, your relatives, or your rich neighbors. If you do, they may invite you back, and so you will be repaid. But when you give a, a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed. Although they cannot repay you, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. May God bless us for the hearing and the reading of the Holy Gospel this morning. This passage, this, this banquet passage, is the passage used in a sister to the Emmaus movement called the Great Banquet. In the Great Banquet, they use this passage and they talk about how we are to invite the stranger, how we're to invite the, the unchurched, de-churched, upset, hating God, whoever, whatever it is. Now, I joke a lot. I mean, that's pretty far from the course. I laugh a lot. I joke a lot. I tell bad jokes. I'm a dad. But one of the things I talk about, too, is, is people come to church and they have their favorite parking spot. And you park in the exact same spot pretty much every time. Then you come in the building and you have your favorite spot that you'd like to sit. And there's reasons behind that. 
I mean, I've, I've talked to people when I've, and I've asked them just point blank, why do you sit where you sit? And they said, well, when we have young kids, we always sat closest to the bathroom because it seems like they always needed to go and, and, and do and whatever. Or we sat nearest the exit because we always had this appointment that we needed to, and so we needed to slip out quick and, and, and go and do and, and all of these. And so it just became habit. We sat here and, and where. Or it was, well, this is where we sat when we were in youth group and all of the youth sat around us, and we still do even though that youth group is now in their you know, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatever the case may be, they've been sitting in those spots since they were knee-high to grasshoppers. And it's amazing the stories of why people sit where they sit. And one lady one time says, well, if I sit over there, it's too cold, and I sit over there, it's too hot, and so I like sitting right here where you know, it's not either and, and all that. Uh, it, it's just amazing. And so we choose our spot. And it's human nature that once you sit in a spot, you, that's your spot. Kids at school and kids on the bus, if, if they, you know, the first day of school, they, they sit in a spot. And that's where they want to sit forever. It's just human nature. It's comfortable. Sometimes, though, we need to give up our seat. Sometimes we have friends and family that come in that maybe needs that seat. Now, I'm not talking about your physical seat. This is getting metaphorical here. Sometimes we need to give up something in the short run for the long-term benefits. It's hard to be humbled. It's hard to admit that we're wrong when we are. It's hard. Oh, trust me, uh, with somebody with an ego the size of mine being wrong, oh my gosh, that's a death sentence. But I'm wrong a lot. Just ask Lauren. <laughs> I make mistakes. We all do. We fall short. We sin. It happens. You know, but it, there's a time that we reconcile. We, we come back together and we say, you know, I, I said these things or I did these things and, and I'm really sorry. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to, to goof this up or I didn't mean to screw this. You know, now, sometimes stuff gets broken. It's broken. And it's broken forever and it just can't be fixed. And that could be relationships. That could be, you know, I, I mean, the, the, the world is endless on what that could be. But you know, there's stuff that's worth fighting for. There's those seats in the world that, that you try to move up. You try to, to become more distinguished. I've got a hat, whatever, and it's, it's from uh, uh, Life is Good, whatever. And it, instead of uh, Grateful Dead, it says Grateful Dad. Now, I'm not the greatest father in the world. Trust me. Uh, all the way from when Caleb was like two years old and I was doing something and I dropped a crowbar on his foot at two years old, a giant crowbar. Yeah, I don't know if it broke or not because, you know, great dad moment. We didn't take him to the doctor or anything. He was, ah, I rubbed some dirt in. You'll be fine. And he is. He's fine, sort of. There's moments that you, you think, okay, did I discipline correctly? The books all say to do it this way, but when the spit hits the spam and you start flowing with <clears throat> colorful language, you think, man, I didn't do that well. As a teacher, I'm sure there's times that, you know, uh, you have this, this class of 80 kids out there. Yeah, they're getting bigger. Maybe not quite 80 yet. But you get these kids out there and you think, okay, I've read their charts, I've read their stuff, whatever. This one is bodily kinesthetic, this one is, is auditory, this one is visionary, this one is how do I teach to the masses? What's the common denominator? You know what the books say, you know what the, the experts say, you know what everybody out there says, but you're on the fly. And you've got all these little minds that are sponges. Wanting to soak it all in. As Christians, we're the same thing. People watch us as Christians. Have you ever noticed that? If you wear some kind of, of, of Jesus garb or witness wear or something, a cross or, or something like that, people watch you. What are they going to do? What are they going to say? Are they going to be honest and trustworthy? Are they going to be human like me? 
They boast that they go to church every single Sunday. I wonder if they really do. Are they lying? See, it happens. And that's why we sit in the farthest away seats, not literally today, but you know, we are good Christians and the front pews are still empty. Because we like to sit further back. We like to sit where there's something in front of us. I'm not sure if it's a protection thing or a shield thing or maybe, you know, the splash zone in case God spikes me dead. I don't know. But we choose our seats carefully. Not physically, but emotionally, mentally, spiritually. We choose our seats carefully. But we go into the world and, and we're humbled by what we see in the world. We see folks that we know, we know they're struggling. We see folks that are, are you know, looking at, I, I saw this at Walmart yesterday. I was there and I was not in pastor mode at all. I was in focus tunnel mode. I was trying to get the stuff that I was required to get on my list, whatever. I even saw several prisoners and I just, hey, how you doing? And gone. And for those of you that I saw at Walmart and I was so tunnel vision that I just barely spoke, sorry, uh, it's one of those things. But I saw this lady, we, I was passing through quickly the meat department, and I saw her looking at these different things of meat, and the little boy says, Mama, what you doing? And in my pastor prerogative of eavesdropping, she says, I'm looking for the cheapest one. It's still going to be meat, but it's going to be the one that is least expensive because we're on that kind of budget. We don't know what folks are going through. Maybe she was a spendthrift. Maybe she was, you know, the one, I can feed my family, but I'm going to do it on the cheapest I can. And maybe it's other. But maybe they were just wondering how we're going to find our next meal. You know? When you throw a banquet, you invite the poor among you so that you'll be blessed in the long run. You know, I... Another one that really got me was in this passage that says, verse 11, For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. I'm reminded of the, of the kids' song, the VBS stuff, Humble thyself in the sight of the Lord, and you, and you will. Yeah, it's, it's a great song. But it always got me because I was always wondering, as a kid, how are you not humble? How are you not humble? And then I got older and I found out there's people that really, really think hot stuff of themselves. Out in the world, you've got people that, that thrive on, on, you know, stirring stuff up and wanting the spotlight and all these things. But that's not really of God. God wants us to be humbled, to be exalted. You go to weddings and you hear the, the Corinthians 13 passage. Maybe you had it read at your wedding. We all know that one. It's called the love chapter. And if I speak in the tongues of men and angels do not have love, I'm only resounding God. But the most important part of this is love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always persevere. Love never fails. And that's what giving up your seed is all about, is loving the other, whoever or whatever the other is. Maybe the other is somebody of a different tribe, different political, different denomination, different thought process. We're to love them. Does that mean that we have to kowtow to everything they say and do? No. Does that mean we have to believe everything they say and do? No. But we are called to Love them. And love never fails. Love never fails. I have found places where love takes a vacation sometimes. Oh, I can't believe they did that. I hate them. Hate's a hard word. Hate is forever. Hate has never done anything good ever. But sometimes love takes a vacation. Sometimes we don't get it. Especially when somebody flips us off or takes our parking spot or sits in our pew. Ah. Yeah. But you know, Jesus addressed that too. In Matthew, he says these words. 
Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the wall, tested him. He's his teacher. <laughs> Which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. All the law of the prophets hang on these two commandments. Love never fails, and we're called to love everyone. Who was our neighbor? Jesus addressed that too. Our neighbor's everyone around us. So how are we to give up our seat? Well, you know, our seat is many things. Sometimes our seat is our pride. Give up your pride and humble yourself and give an apology. Sometimes giving up our seat is, is the seat of, of preference. Maybe somebody else needs to have a, a closer look or a better look. Sometimes giving up our seat is our pride, our fears, our anger, our frustration. <laughs> It's not easy. It's not easy to give up our seat, especially when Jesus says, invite the poor, invite the stinky, invite the ones that nobody really wants around. Those people, invite them to come to your banquet. How do we do that? Well, it's, again, it's not easy. And there's others in the world, there's givers and there's takers, and the takers will always take more than the givers have. That's a given. But all from your seat, whatever that is. All from your prayers, all from your presence, all from your gifts, offer them your time, offer your seat to those around you. Sometimes Christianity seems impossible. Love everybody. Offer them everything. Give till it hurts. Sacrifice more. Love. Always. Pray. Continuously. God, you don't know what you ask. My time's important. My stuff is mine. My, yeah, God, I agree. It's, it's really all yours. And I'll do it, Lord. I'll do it for you. I ain't going to like it much, but I'll do it. So, Lord, here's my seat. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.
Come on.